Hi, I'm Adam Meekins, a physiotherapist and a strength and conditioning specialist from London in England, sometimes known as the Sports Physio, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Physio Creme and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the latest and greatest information, highs, lows, and learnings from our featured guests, all centered on the show's purpose, which is to help you pursue and perform at your own physical best. We do this across a range of episodes, including interest editions, coaches' corners, featured performers, and expert editions. And this week, we keep the expert edition theme running. Last week, I shared with you a conversation with leading sporting hip orthopedic surgeon and expert. Dr. Patrick Weinrack, the focus on all things hips. This week, we shift from the hip to the shoulder with Adam Meekins. With shoulder pain having a lifetime prevalence of 70%, 50% of people experiencing an episode of shoulder pain every year, and between 40 and 50% of people with shoulder pain having ongoing concerns and symptoms 6 to 12 months after onset, it's a topic that we need to explore. Previously, I shared with you a conversation with PhD scholar and physiotherapist Jared Powell on all things rotator cuff related shoulder pain and also frozen shoulders. In today's guest's parlance, we've already explored on this show the stiff shoulder and the weak shoulder. However, there's one category of shoulder pain and presentation that we are yet to explore and that is the purpose of this expert edition and that is the unstable shoulder or as today's guest Adam Meekins prefers, the loose shoulder. Now, what on earth is a loose shoulder? Well, as the name suggests, it's a shoulder whose looseness can lead to problems. And on today's episode, Adam will explore the categories of an unstable or loose shoulder in his parlance, the worn, the born, and the torn loose shoulder. Just think dislocations on a football field or some of those ugly party tricks that your friends do where they contort themselves into seemingly impossible positions. So I implore you, even if you have not experienced shoulder pain, to stay tuned in to this expert edition. There are great principles on how to maintain a healthy shoulder across your lifespan, common mistakes people make in training shoulders, and so much more. And by way of bio, Adam Meekins, a.k.a. the sports physio, the original sports physio online on social media, is a physiotherapist, a strength and conditioning specialist, and an extended scope practitioner in both the National Health Service and private practice in Herefordshire, England. Throughout his career, Adam has worked in many roles, including professional sport, and has been fortunate to work with and learn from some of the world's leading shoulder authorities and experts. Adam has helped a wide and diverse range of people, from professional athletes to the general public and understands the importance of robust progressive rehabilitation being integral to the recovery of injury and optimization of the body through life. One of the things I personally respect and admire about Adam Meekins is he strongly believes in a no-nonsense, simple, practical and evidence-based approach to therapy and the physiotherapy profession. Adam's actively involved in a number of clinical research projects and has published papers in peer-reviewed journals and also written a chapter for the latest edition of the best-selling sports medicine book, Bruckner and Kahn's Clinical Sports Medicine. So tune on in, a pen and paper ready for this expert edition as we explore the unstable or loose shoulder with Adam Meekins.
Adam Meekins, uh, I have been looking forwards to this for a long time. Thank you for your contribution today and also welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Thanks for inviting me. Adam, just before we press record, you said you like a good wobbly shoulder and that is certainly the, the focus of this expert edition is having a look at all things the unstable shoulder. We recently featured a colleague of yours, Jared Powell on all things rotator cuff related shoulder concerns and today we're going to focus on the unstable or as you said the wobbly shoulder so by before we jump into the wobbly shoulder just by way of context what's a typical day week year look like in the life of Adam Meekins the original sports physio <laughs> uh, well it's a bit mixed and varied so I've, I've just undergone a little bit of a change in my normal working practice so I've been a physio now for nearly 20 years and uh, it used to be quite a standard sort of practice sort of going in 9 to 5 Monday to Friday in the NHS the National Health Service system uh, then I went into private practice started changing my hours a bit being a bit more flexible so for the last sort of 10 or so years I've, uh, I've sort of had a split role between the NHS and private practice where I've been working uh, two days a week in the NHS as a, uh, an ESP which is a sort of an extended scope role that physiotherapists in the UK now are getting into working alongside uh, various different uh, 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 profession. So I work alongside the orthopaedic uh, group in the upper limb service for the West Hearts Trust in the National Health Service. And I, I triage and I assess. I'm a first point of contact. I have all the same privileges as an orthopaedic consultant. So I do that two days a week, which includes diagnostic ultrasound scanning, injections if I need to as well, uh, referring on for imaging, blood tests, uh, so basically say planning a, a program or a, a plan of action for somebody with an upper limb condition. And then the other sort of day-to-day -day job is private practice, working as a, a job in physiotherapist uh, where I specialise in the sort of management of the upper limb, uh, shoulder being the main area of my focus and interest. But I see all walks of sports injuries and chronic pain injuries as well into that role as well. And Adam, uh, very strong background in strength and conditioning? Yeah, so my background is uh, physiotherapy is actually my third profession. Um, don't let these youthful looks fool you. I've been around the block a few times. Uh, so this is now my third uh, profession so when I left school 25 six ooh, even probably longer years ago I actually went into the military for a few years so that was my first uh, experience of the working world and then after I came out of the military I did my first degree my first bachelor of science in sports science so that was uh, learning about exercise physiology programming periodization and then I worked as a strength coach uh, after I gained that uh, degree, worked in a few various different locations under a few different uh, different places uh, and started to see athletes and people having injuries and not sure how to proceed. And that's what led me eventually into the third career of physiotherapy. So I went into university in 2000 and uh, managed to just about qualify as a physiotherapist. Because I found it quite tough, I must be honest. I think my my undergraduate training, uh, I found not what I was expecting. I, I came up with some issues and barriers with some of the stuff that the tutors were telling me. I think because I was a mature student, being around a block a bit before, I had some friction with some of the tutors, which I probably you know, still probably do time to time when I stick my neck out too much too often. And uh, so that caused a bit of a problem. But I eventually managed to qualify as a physio and say I've been there jobbing along uh, as best as I can do since. And uh, certainly that bit of background paints context to your high level of self-control and discipline on social media, Adam. Uh, and certainly uh, Adam Meekins and Friction uh, go together like gin and tonic. Uh, you, you state with your shoulder courses, you tend to find that a simple, straightforward approach often works well with most things in life and shoulder issues are no different. It really is a no BS approach, and that's something I've uh, benefited from uh, colleague to colleague. So should we take that filter and talk about the wobbly, unstable shoulder? Let's do it. I learned from you, Adam Meekins, that there are really only three types of uh, shoulders that will present in clinic, uh, excluding what you would term the masqueraders, the shoulder pain being caused, if you like, by something like the neck, the stiff and painful shoulder, the weak and painful shoulder, and the unstable or wobbly and painful potentially shoulder. So we're going to focus on the wobbly unstable shoulder. What is it, Adam, and uh, why does it matter to the general population and the sporting population? Yeah, good question. Um, I think 
uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what do we actually call them? Because I actually got, I used to call them the unstable shoulder and I still do call it an unstable shoulder, but I, uh, I was quite fortunate to have a, a discussion with Peter O'Sullivan when he was over in London doing his cognitive functional therapy workshops. And he was asking me about what my teaching is and what I do. And I was explaining this classification system, the stiff shoulder, the weak shoulder and the, um, the unstable shoulder. He went, Oh, you shouldn't call it unstable. You said, uh, you know, that, that can be a bit of a nocebic term to use. We want to be careful with the language we use when we discuss uh, conditions to patients. And and I sort of went back and I thought about it because I respect Peter O'Sullivan a lot. You know, I, I value his thoughts and opinions a lot. And um, the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, perhaps he does have a, a point there. I think for some people, calling a shoulder unstable sometimes can be probably the wrong terminology or wording to use. So... I, I've changed it a little bit. I now call it a loose shoulder. Uh, so I use that definition more than I will use the unstable shoulder, although I still occasionally do call it unstable from time to time, just out of habit. So what is an unstable or loose shoulder? I think that was the other question you wanted to ask. Well, for me, the sort of very sort of generic definition of a unstable loose shoulder is a shoulder that has excessive movement on the humeral head. Uh, on the glenoid that produces a, a person to feel a sensation of or a fear of displacement or there is actual true physical displacement that's observable. So I think that is my sort of very generic definition of the loose shoulder. And I think the key factor is, is that it has to be symptomatic because, again, we do see loose shoulders out there that are non-symptomatic. So there are people out there that can do some weird and wonderful things that would potentially go into that category of being adverse movement of the humeral head on the glenoid. So they can do these party tricks where you only have to go on Instagram and see all these bloody videos of people moving their shoulders, twisting them around in all sorts of angles that, you know, can make you feel like you want to vomit and throw up. But they've got no symptoms. They're quite happy. They're showing off. They haven't got any sensations of pain or discomfort. And therefore, you know, we've got to use that term adverse or excessive movement of the humeral head on the glenoid with a bit of with a bit of pinch of salt. We're after the ones that are symptomatic. And by symptomatic, Adam, does that include apprehensive uh, apprehension? Like, oh gosh, this doesn't feel like it's a good place for my shoulder to be. Absolutely, I, I think that is the primary diagnosis. In fact, I think most people with loose shoulders don't actually have observable signs of looseness. I think a lot of them have the sensations, the apprehensions, or just the fear and avoidance of using their arm and their shoulder normally because they get this sort of feedback with inside the system that says this shoulder is going to do something adverse if I carry on moving it in this direction. Okay, this is great. So we're throwing out unstable shoulder largely. We're going with the loose shoulder. You use the term nocebic, uh, that the unstable shoulder could be, you know, it could be a nocebic term. Can you uh, outline what you mean by that, Adam. Yeah, I, again, I think when we just think of our language having an impact on those that we see, uh, we see that, you know, some some of the terms we use, the medical terms, can sometimes instill some either, you know, misunderstanding into some individuals or actually some fear. So I, I think particularly when you think of things like back pain, uh, when we're talking about unstable spines, people talk about unstable pelvises as a cause for their back pain. We know that these have negative deleterious effects on patients' outcomes when they are led to believe or are thought to believe that their their body is unstable, their body is easily displaced, goes out of position, and therefore they need somebody else to put it back into position. Now, I think the shoulder is, is a little bit different than calling a spine or a pelvis unstable because, you know, that is, I think, more fear induces. And the shoulder obviously is a bit of a unique body part in the fact that it does actually become physically loose, unstable due to various different factors, uh, whereas the pelvis, you know, very, very rarely is going to become physically unstable. I learned the language, the power of language, Adam, when I was a 15-year-old junior triathlete and my physio told me that I had childbearing hips and I didn't quite know what that <laughs> meant, but I thought that can't be good. Maybe that's a, a, a full stop on my triathlon career. <laughs> Uh, that that's brilliant. Uh, well, it's not brilliant. No, I say uh, again. You, I think you know physios in, with all good intentions. They say these things, and and I think a lot of it is just flippant 
comments and and a lot of us just don't actually sit back and realize that's just had a massive impact on somebody i see it a lot with scapulars i see people being diagnosed as having wonky or wobbly scapulars uh, and these thoughts just stick in patients heads for years and years and years and the amount of patients that have come to see me and said i oh i've got a wobbly scapula before i've even looked at them and seen them uh, and I said, why do you say that? Well, I, I saw a therapist and they said it six, seven years ago. They told me I've got this wonky scapula and I go around the back and I eventually have a look and I can't see anything clearly obvious. So, you know, we just got to be wary that some things that we say flippantly or, or, or whatever sometimes stick with patients. Yeah, so it's so important. And I mean, I vowed if I ever become a physio to not abuse the uh, my words and, uh, and plant seeds of doubt or fear in, in anyone that I've, I've seen. And hopefully over the years I've learnt from my own bad experience. But uh, Adam, the terminology matters. Uh, can you just outline the difference between a subluxing shoulder and a dislocating shoulder? Oftentimes, you know, a physio might take or a practitioner might take a history from someone and they might ask something about trauma. Has your shoulder ever popped out or dislocated and uh sometimes i see that you know people will say yeah i've had multiple dislocations and then when you dr- drill a little bit deeper it hasn't been a dislocation it's been more of a you know what we term a subluxation so can you take us through that yeah well i suppose the official definition of a dislocation is that of the shoulder is the humeral head is is completely off the glenoid uh, so, you know, you've got actually no contact of the humeral head on the glenoid surface. That would be what constitutes a dislocation. Now, dislocations can be spontaneously reoccurring. Uh, so you can dislocate it, i.e. take the humeral head completely off the glenoid and it returns back to the uh, original position, you know, sometimes within a fraction of a second. So that could still be classed as a true dislocation, even though it occurred very quickly. Subluxations are where the humeral head slips on the glenoid but doesn't completely come off. So that is sometimes categorized as either being a 25% subluxation. So the humeral head slides 25% off the glenoid, 50%, 75%. Very hard to classify that sort of detail, but some believe that's what they can do with certain testing, etc. So the delineation that if it's popped itself back in, then it's not a true dislocation isn't necessarily accurate. Yeah, I'd still class that as a dislocation if it's come completely off the glenoid and then even though it's gone spontaneously back on, it is still classed as a true dislocation. That I wouldn't class that as a subluxation, no. Okay, noted. Adam, in preparing for this conversation, uh, I pulled out some statistics about the burden of shoulder pain in, in, in society. It's reported as being the third most common musculoskeletal problem in the general population. Up to 50% of the population will have an episode of shoulder pain per year. And then concerningly, 40 to 50% of new shoulder pain presentations continue to experience symptoms six to 12 months after onset. When it comes to the loose, or in your terms, the wobbly shoulder, do you have any insights into the the prevalence or incidence of this in in populations well uh, again i think it depends on what type of loose shoulder we're talking about because there are different sort of classifications uh, again i think that's the first thing to try and narrow down are we talking trauma are we talking non-trauma um, and again, you know, classification of the loose shoulder is something that is, you know, variable from person to person who you talk about. There have been many different ways to try and classify uh, the loose shoulder. Uh, historically, we've had the acronyms of TUBS and AMBRIS. Uh, so TUBS used to stand for, still does stand for traumatic, unidirectional, bank heart, and then surgery. And AMBRIS uh, stands for the atraumatic, multidirectional, bilateral, rehab, and if that doesn't work, inferior capsular shift operations so those were the sort of two original classifications of loose shoulders that are either traumatic or atraumatic and you either was unidirectional or uh, multidirectional Um, but that has been more or less moved away from now because it isn't that simple Uh, with loose shoulders there's there's other classifications of why shoulders become loose so the next one that's more popular is the Stanmore classification of loose shoulders so this is the type 1 traumatic loose shoulder then you have the type 2 non-traumatic uh, loose shoulder. And then there's this third group that Stanmore came up with. This is the type 3 muscle patterning uh, loose shoulder. So this is a shoulder that has, again, no history of trauma, but no sort of congenital or abnormalities around it structurally, but they still have instability. 
Now, those are, I think the Stanmore Triangle is the one that I was trained with and I used the most uh, through my career. But I have I have moved away from using the Stanmore Triangle. And, and I, again, over my sort of process of simplification of the shoulder, I've come up with a much more simpler classification that I find works really well for me. And the reason I like it as well is because it rhymes. It is a three it is a three tier classification system again, like the Stanmore, but they're either torn loose, worn loose, or born loose. Torn loose, worn loose, or born loose. So uh, torn, worn, or born. So your torn loose are clearly your traumatic uh, incidences. So that can be, you know, either an acute trauma or sometimes it's an historic trauma. So there can still be trauma, uh, you know, somebody that still has a loose shoulder years and years and years after uh, they've had their original trauma. The worn loose, sometimes some people call this the acquired instability overuse syndromes, um, but I call this a worn loose. This is a shoulder that has become loose with no history of frank trauma in their background, uh, but sensations or actual true instability now gradually, slowly, progressively over time as as the structures around the shoulder, I think, are becoming uh, worn loose. And then, of course, you've got the congenital, the born loose shoulders, and again, that can be due to congenital abnormalities, uh, uh, structural deformities around the shoulder or classically more commonly the genetic reasons for instability of born loose and that's the the hypermobility syndromes Ellos Danlos syndromes etc so three simple classifications torn worn and born for me tends to work quite well the most common prevalent type that that presents to uh, physios and medical de- medical departments will be the torn loose shoulder the traumatic one that makes up about 75 percent of all shoulder instability episodes the other two, the worn loose and born loose, make up roughly about 25%. Uh, and there's a mixture there, as you say, of, of various different sort of types. I really like this. I have trouble saying Stanmore classification. So this is uh, this is certainly uh, much easier. Torn, worn and born. Uh, 75% yep. of all shoulder instabilities are the torn type, the traumatic type. Adam, uh, what are some uh, examples that you commonly see uh, in terms of the torn type mechanisms of injury so yeah trauma uh causing a shoulder to become loose uh there's two main directions well technically three but i haven't come across an inferior one but mainly the two main directions are going to be anteriorly or posteriorly dislocated under traumatic uh, circumstances again the most common is an anterior traumatic dislocation. Now, the anterior dislocation classically occurs with a sudden movement of the arm being forced into abduction and external rotation, normally combined. Now, that can be because the arm gets pulled violently back behind them, or classically, more often, it's the actual trunk being rotated away from the arm. Uh, and that tends to this movement with the arm out in abduction and external rotation cause the humeral head to cantilever off the anterior inferior portion of the glenoid and anteriorly dislocate so that's the most common mechanism of injury uh, for trauma then you do get the posterior dislocations as well under traumatic circumstances so you can dislocate the humeral head out the back of the the, the shoulder socket uh, classically, this occurs uh, with a direct landing onto the elbow. So sometimes if you land forward, elbow first, that force is transferred up through the humerus and can actually cause the shoulder to dislocate posteriorly. It also occurs, again, similar to the abduction, uh, the anterior dislocation in abduction in contact sports, so rugby. So with the arm out to the side, trying to stop a player running past you, a direct blow to the humerus coming from the anterior force will actually also cause a shoulder to dislocate posteriorly. So posterior dislocations occur a lot in tackling contact type sports. They also occur a lot in electrocutions and seizures as well. So again, somebody who has an electrocution, a sudden bolt of muscle contractions tend to cause the shoulder to dislocate posteriorly. And that's technically our class of traumatic posterior dislocation. So there's the contact, the electri- electrocutions, which hopefully uh, aren't that common, and the seizures yeah. uh, that may cause the posterior dislocations. And I've heard you cite before, Adam, that posterior dislocations or out the back uh, happen more commonly than certainly many health professionals 
believe. Yeah, th- th- there is a high prevalence that, you know, that, that are missed in traumatic circumstances because most people assume it's an anterior dislocation. Posterior dislocations are very strange in that they leave no observable physical deformity. So what they tend to do is just cause the shoulder not to be able to move. So you're ending up with a locked posterior dislocation, a shoulder that just doesn't want to move. But when you observe them, the posterior dislocation doesn't look any different from the other side. So there's no observable deformity. It's the weirdest thing in the world. I've had a few of these actually missed in A&E and come to see me. And the, the, the shoulder is out of socket. And when you look at them and you palpate them, there is no clear deformity. The anterior dislocation is a piece of piss to spot, you know, because you get get this clear visible deformity around the shoulder girdle. So with an anterior dislocation, it inferiorly subluxes as well. So it drops down below the glenoid. So you get a lengthened arm, you get the square uh, deltoid sign, you get a clear visible sulcus underneath the acromion from one side to the other, as well as an arm that just doesn't want to move. The posterior dislocation does not look like that. It looks symmetric because it just pops out the back. It doesn't actually inferiorly drop down when it dislocates. So you don't actually see much difference from one side to the other. So you have to be wary of those because they can present sometimes to physios uh, because they get missed in A&Es. There was a paper, it's a little bit old now, it's about I think nearly five or six years old, that shows that in the UK, 80% of traumatic posterior dislocations were missed in A&E departments and they end up in front of physiotherapists. And the best way is to keep an index of suspicion with trauma uh, not to be deceived by observation or appearances alone and to, I guess, drill down on the mechanism of injury, landing on that elbow, uh, contact sports, seizures, uh, you know, fits, etc. Absolutely. Anybody who has that sort of history who has severe restriction around their shoulder, particularly into external rotations, they're unable to externally rotate, you know, probably beyond neutral. They can't elevate probably much beyond 30 or 40 degrees, both actively and passively with a pain response. Uh, with that sort of history of mechanism you know a week or two in the past suspect a posterior dislocation until proven otherwise don't rely on a normal looking x-ray as well because x-rays from an ap direction can look normal as well although the shoulder is still out of the socket the best view is to get the lateral view or the axial view on an x-ray to have a look at that and then you can see the humeral head posteriorly translated off the glenoid okay so the, the type of views are important for any images particularly plain films uh adam my first uh, experience as a 2B physio with a, uh, a dislocation was a gentleman named Dale at the local AFL team here in, uh, here in Australia on the Gold Coast. And Dale was known to dislocate his shoulder on, on almost most matches. And um, it was something else. And Dale refused to go to the A&E department. I was a sports trainer. He came off the field in a big mess, uh, anterior dislocation. And uh, he was shaking, full of adrenaline. And I pulled out the Bruckner and Kahn textbook to look at how to help him uh, try and reduce this if he was refusing to go to the hospital. And with shaky hands, trying to flip the pages, I said to Dale, hey, lay on your tummy and rest your arm off the side and dangle a weight in your arm. Come on, you'll be right. And it didn't seem to work. So Dale resorted to yanking his arm overhead and he's moving around and screaming. And, um, and you know, I think it took some time. I don't know what happened in the end. I nearly passed out before he did. But, but uh, Dale continued to play, turn up week after week. Uh, I don't know how Dale went in the end, but uh, over, over the long term. But, you know, what do we do if we're, we're not health professionals? We see someone dislocate the shoulder. What, what's the first uh, point of call? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the simple answer is, is that, yeah, they need, they really need to go and have it professionally put back in. So if it's out and it still looks deformed um, and it hasn't gone back in spontaneously, then you're right. Physiotherapists are not the healthcare professionals to relocate dislocated shoulders. So it normally needs to go to A&E and it normally needs to be put in by an orthopedic registrar or consultant or an A&E consultant. Lots of different methods and techniques to try and uh, reduce uh, an anterior or posterior dislocated shoulder. Um, there's there's lots of them being reported, different you know ways to hang it off over the edge of the bed, like you said. The other one is just simply just trying to externally rotate it gently, and that can cantilever it back in. If it's an anterior dislocation, I've heard of placing a fist inside the armpit as well before to try and help the muscles relax. 
Uh, what's the other? Even just a massage technique called the Cunningham technique, where you just softly massage the trapezius and the deltoid muscle, and that is allowed to, or thought to allow the, an anterior dislocator to to get their uh, humeral head back onto the glenoid. So massage, manual therapy might have a role sometimes in certain circumstances. <laughs> uh, but no, we, we, our main goal is to say is to take them to an A and E and emergency department and get it back in if it hasn't gone back in spontaneously. Uh, the less force, normally the better the less trauma is likely to be caused of it going back in. So it's not advisable just to yank it and pull it back in because that can actually cause more damage going back in than it did coming out. Uh, and also we've got to be careful. I mean, it's very rare, but you can have neurovascular compromise with a with a dislocation. So obviously if the brachial plexus is affected, you know, and there is neuro, uh, neurological damage, that can obviously have long-term consequences and of course vascular compromise which is even rarer but it could theoretically happen where again if you have a loss of blood supply to the upper limb that's going to cause some pretty serious issues fantastic uh well not fantastic but great information and uh you're known for a good maxim a uh, a cheesy maxim adam uh what about if it's out get it checked out doesn't really rhyme though does it no but it's, it's close i like that one <laughs> i like that one yeah. adam uh, so that's the uh that's the torn loose shoulder uh, worn loose uh, in Adam Meekins' uh, classifications of the loose wobbly shoulder. Uh, can you yep. can you unpack the worn loose shoulder a little more? Yeah, so this will be a, a an individual who is complaining of sensations or fears of instability of their shoulder, uh, but with no frank history of trauma. So they'll say that, you know, they've not had a traumatic episode or a single preceding event that first brought on these sensations but rather it's a slow, gradual, insidious onset that may or may not be, you know, increasing in frequency and occurrence rates. So the, the theory is here is that these individuals are over a process of time causing some structures around their shoulder to fail and start to affect the stability of the humeral head on the glenoid. Now, they may be the passive structures or they may be the active structures around the shoulder. So it could be, you know, the incongruity of the labrum that's slowly gradually uh, causing it to allow it to become unstable so there may be a label tear in there that's progressively and getting worse as time going on could be a capsule ligamentous type issue or it could be a, a muscular type you know deconditioning effect around the shoulder there's something there that could also be contributing to it to becoming slowly unstable in time and really interesting you said there it may or may not be related to the increase or otherwise frequency of of uh rates of these this, this experience so does that mean you know we can't place a lot of stock on has this been happening more often in more recent in recent times yeah again sometimes with these shoulders the history i hear is it, it, it starts to come on then it can fade away and then it can come back on again later on uh then it plateaus and then it suddenly increases or then it suddenly decreases so they have quite an erratic type of history um and i, and I think sometimes it may be due to environmental or activities that they are doing or not doing so it could be that you know if you've got the weekend warrior who is working their upper limbs you know quite hard during a season of trying athlete and swimming yet in the off season they're not sometimes it's during the off season they get these sensations of instability as they get a bit deconditioned and the active system calms down they do certain activities and they start to feel unstable yet once they start training and going back in they recondition the system it all starts to feel a bit better or stabilizes and then it can be the opposite way around some individuals particularly with the throwing the overhead athletes the more they do of those tasks and activities the more they get those sensations sensations and then when they stop it actually starts to feel a bit more stable so from my sort of thinking there i'm thinking either that's telling me it's more likely to be a passive structure that's causing this as an issue or it's more likely to be an active structure around the shoulder that's causing the issue and just to explain passive and active structures uh adam so again whenever i try to in my head theorize what type of loose shoulder is this apart from obviously the torn worn or born i also want to know is is what contributing factors is the structure around the shoulder contributing to this looseness so is there some passive problems there so we're talking things like torn of the labrums uh, capsule ligamentous issues bony defects which we know can occur quite at high prevalence after trauma so you know you could be dealing with a shoulder that has some passive structural instability but then there could also be the active structures around the glenohumeral joint so that's issues with the rotator cuffs endurance strength 
biomechanical function. Or it could be, again, the, the active structures around the shoulder, such as, you know, the major muscles, the pecs, the delts, the lats that could be overactive or, again, underactive, pulling the humeral head too aggressively off the glenoid as well. So this is where this muscle patterning theory came in from Stanmore. And then the other thing to consider, there's also the psychological factors as well, the psychosocial factors that can cause a shoulder to become loose. So I think there's three sort of key areas, passive structures, active structures, and then psychosocial variable factors. So the fear, anxiety, avoidance, you know, sometimes it's just a cry for attention. Uh, and then people start to get these shoulders becoming loose and wobbly and unstable because of those factors predominantly. And there's not much going wrong with their passive or active structures. And uh, so, uh, you know, what jumped out is they can be overuse or potentially disuse. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you've got to keep an open mind. Uh, and to, to classify it as worn loose, do they need to have presented with episodes of, you know, of uh, subluxations or dislocations, like, uh, you know. No, I think, again, it's it's the history of them telling you they just don't trust their shoulder or they're getting some internal sensation of something feeling unstable or loose or they just don't want to put their arm in a certain position or do a certain task because they don't trust it's going to maintain its integrity. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, a visible, observable subluxation. We're, we're going with their sensations as well. Okay, and they just don't trust it. Uh, and then the, yeah. the born loose, you know, you touched on this, yep. the the torn loose, the worn loose, the born loose as the subcategories, if you like, of the loose shoulder, congenital abnormalities, uh, you know, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yep. So again, there's sort of two sort of different versions of the born loose shoulder. There's, there's actual congenital abnormalities uh, form, so you can have uh, bony birth defects, you can have humeral head shape defects, you can have glenoid dysplasia. So again, that's not commonly uh, recognized, but you can be dysplastic of your glenoid, just like you can be dysplastic of the acetabulum in the hips. Um, you can obviously have uh, rotational sort of versions too much, either anteriorly or posteriorly of the glenoid face as well, which could also predispose it to becoming unstable. Um, so you have these bony issues. You can also have the caps. Are you taking a photograph of me while we're recording? <laughs> uh, uh, where was I? You're putting me off a bit there, mate. So you can also have the uh, capsule and the labral uh, birth defects. So again, some people are congenitally born with parts of the labrum or their capsule uh, absent. Uh, that may predispose the shoulder to becoming uh, loose uh, over time. Uh, but I think the most common reason for born loose shoulders is the genetic factors, uh, the connective tissue laxity syndromes, uh, things like Ellos Danlos and hypermobility syndrome. That's probably the most common reason for a shoulder to be born loose. Yeah, and and they are often the ones, pretend not often, but sometimes the ones making themselves onto social media or doing the radical party tricks that make everyone want to vomit. Yeah, absolutely. So they 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 can be non symptomatic a lot of the time as well, but a lot some of them can then progress and start to become symptomatic over time. You mentioned there something that just kind of makes sense that is the potential for uh, socket shoulder socket, if you like, in simple terms, uh, dysplasia, which I think most people recognise that that can be something that can occur at the hip, but obviously can happen in the shoulder as well. Yeah, I, I find a lot of physiotherapists, healthcare professionals, doctors are less aware of the upper limb uh, variations in anatomy uh, compared to the lower limb variations in anatomy that we talk about. So, yeah, you can you can have, let's say, all these sort of similar things, torsions, versions, uh, dysplasia in the upper limb just as much as, or not just as much, but just, you know, as often, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, as, as well as in the lower limb. And you mentioned also bony defects can occur within the loose shoulder. So what are some of the bony defects that can occur, Adam? So with traumatic sort of dislocations, I mean, the, the, the key two bony injuries you can get, you can get the bony bank art, which is a glenoid fracture. Uh, and you can also get the heel sacs, which is a humeral head fracture. So uh, the glenoid fracture isn't as common. The bony bank art is less common. It's got a, probably about a 20% um, incidence rate after trauma dislocations. Uh, it classically occurs, again, for the anterior dislocation in the anterior inferior quadrant. So you chip off the sort of front lower heart or portion of the glenoid. Uh, so that's the bony bank art. And then you have the heel sacs. Now, the heel sacs lesion, heel sacs 
depression fracture, whatever you want to call it, is much more common occurring after a dislocation because the humeral head bone is a lot softer than the glenoid bone. So that tends to lose out the vast, vast majority of time. So that's got a, probably about an 80% uh, occurrence rate after traumatic dislocation. Now, some of these bony defects will not cause any further problems. Other ones will do. So you can find that some hill sacs lesions uh, can be pretty large, pretty deep, or just in the wrong place on the humeral head and cause ongoing instability issues later on down the line. Uh, and that's the same with the glenoid fractures. Again, if a glenoid fracture is too large, too big, it will cause ongoing instability issues later on. It really depends on how they sort of heal. And unfortunately, you tend to find most of these fractures of the glenoid don't unite once they've happened. You're listening to Adam Meekins, a.k.a. The Sports Physio, on this and expert edition on all things the unstable shoulder. Support for today's show comes from Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. And its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocreme can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, Chemist or Health Store, as well as via their online shop. Physiocreme have offered 20% off their entire range to listeners of the Physica Performance Show online. Use the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O, and jump over to the shop, physiocreme.com.au. That's F-I-S-I-O. C-R-E-M.com.au to redeem this offer. Hurting Sucks and Physiocram have got you back. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. And we want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. To get there, we do not want to see you for a single session more than what you need or a single session less. We just want to see you get back to your physical best doing the things that you love to do. To find out more about Pogo Physio's award-winning services, including our one-hour initial appointment or our popular telehealth physiotherapy services that allow you to get assistance worldwide, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. But for now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition, Adam Meekins, the sports physio on all things the unstable shoulder. Adam, maybe just speaking more broadly, What are some of the key principles in terms of rehabilitation or uh, managing the loose shoulder? Yeah, it's a big topic. It's a big area. And again, it all depends on what type of loose shoulder you've you've got. So, And again, the history will sort of give you an indication of whether this one is going to be rehabable or not, I think. So again, I I think there is uh, always a role for trying rehab for all primary first-time traumatic dislocators. I don't, in my opinion, and again, some will disagree with this, particularly my orthopedic colleagues, I do not think that a primary anterior or posterior dislocator under traumatic circumstances needs to rush or start to panic to think they need surgery straight away. The recurrent dislocator under trauma or even one that's had trauma and now is becoming unstable or are currently dislocating with less traumatic incidences around the shoulder, that's when I think our orthopedic colleagues can help us and step up and then try to look to help improve the congruency of the structures around the shoulder that may be contributing. So for me, I think management of the torn loose shoulder primary dislocators always, always, always try rehab first and see how it goes. We are aware that there will be some structural defects around there. I mean, the other sort of damage you can do to the torn loose shoulder, obviously we talked about the bony ones, but, you know, there's a high prevalence of labral tears. So I think that's got about a 95% prevalence rate. So after every anterior dislocation, 95% of people will have a labrum tear. Capsules can also be torn, ligaments can be torn, and obviously all the the, the rotator cuff tendons in the older dislocator can be affected. Now, again, not those, some of those will settle down. They will not cause any further ongoing issues. The stability of the shoulder can be re, uh, placed back into good alignment with uh, time and rehabilitation. Others will, uh, will won't, and others will still have ongoing instability issues with time. It, it is really a, a waiting time and good rehab, I think, for a primary traumatic dislocator to see how it goes. And so that's, there's some great, uh, great tips there. First-time dislocators, 
don't panic. Don't necessarily rush to seek a surgical opinion or orthopedic opinion. And getting them out the sling. Getting them. That was my next question. Uh, in terms of you know to immobilize or not the good old sling. Yeah. Yes or no. I mean, I remember being a physio student, seeing the external rotation, um, external rotation slings at the Australian Institute of Sport, and I just wanted to burst out laughing, thinking how impractical it was. But um, aside from the the humor factor, it was. I didn't know how this uh, volleyballer was going to get around um, <laughs> yeah. in a crowd. So uh, yeah. can you uh, outline the, the latest on um, on this, the, the slings or not slinging? Yes. Uh, in the UK currently at the moment, the British Orthopaedic Association and the British Elbow uh, Shoulder Society uh, have a guideline that says if you're primary first time shoulder dislocated, do not immobilize it after reduction. Um, if you are going to immobilize it, it's for a very, very brief short period of time. You're talking probably less than a week, you know, a day or two. And then that shoulder needs to start moving and getting back into day to day tasks and activities. So originally, the theory was is once you dislocated your shoulder, you know, you're going to have some structural damage around it. We need to give it a period of time to allow these structures to heal back. What we have learned is that they don't do that. The reason we used to give external rotation uh, wedges slings is the belief that with an anterior dislocation, you place the arm into external rotation. It draws back all those structures that have been damaged anteriorly. So the tissue tension pulls the labrum back that allows it to sit back closer to the glenoid and therefore it it reestablishes, it unites, it, it prevents recurrence later on down the line. It doesn't do that. External rotation wedge braces do not prevent recurrence down the line. So again, we found that immobilization in general probably doesn't help the structures heal and it doesn't prevent uh, reoccurrence later on down the line. And what it may actually be doing is maybe actually impeding their recovery. Placing somebody with a first-time dislocator into a sling, you're going to give them a period of time of less activity. So the active structures around the shoulder are going to get deconditioned, which then could cause them to feel more unstable later on down the line. It could also cause them to have a loss of proprioceptive input into the shoulder, which will reduce their ability to know where their shoulder is in space and, again, could also impede it. And I also think it has a huge factor on their fear of re-injury and fragility. You, you ask somebody who's undergone a traumatic shoulder dislocation to keep it protected and wrapped up for four to six weeks – that starts to make it feel secure and safe. And then once they have to start moving it away from their body, their fear, their anxiety starts to be increased. Whereas if you can show somebody very quickly, very soon, that they can move it around without it causing it to come off or get any major problems, I think that can help them very much so. But, and I'm going to add a bit of a but here as well. So that was our guidance and still is our guidance in the UK. But I know Margie Olds has just recently done some research. Her PhD uh, has just come out where she looked at factors that help reduce the risk of recurrence in uh, dislocators, uh, primary first-time dislocators. And she actually found a period of immobilization may help reduce the recurrence. So it just as when I thought I got my head around it, just as when I thought I got the right advice and guidance I was giving people, this review by Margie Olds has come out and says, actually, we, we perhaps do want to immobilize primary first-time dislocators. The only downside is we don't know for how long. We don't know what the optimum time is. So it could be a week. It could be four weeks. It could be six weeks. We don't know. But for me, most of the time, I am still going with the primary advice I just talked about and not immobilizing a first-time dislocator. And what guidelines might you put around? They walk out, they're like, okay, Adam tells me I don't need a sling, but Adam's also said to be wary of, or are there no wearies of? No, absolutely. So they've got, I, I think, four to six weeks avoiding end of ranges. Uh, so they don't go into extreme end of ranges for four to six weeks, but they can still use that arm actively in what I class as sort of the inner zone, you know, so they can do most day-to-day -day activities without any issues. They are to start rehabilitation early, so they are to start the strengthening uh, work as soon as possible. Uh, to try and, again, flood that system with proprioceptive information, keep the active elements around that shoulder uh, from de deconditioning. Uh, but they're doing it, you know, with some care and consideration. They're taking their time. They're not doing ballistic works. And they're certainly not going back into contact or risky environments. And if preferable, from my perspective nowadays, I've changed my views. I try to tell all my primary first-time dislocators, particularly if they're under the age of 25, do not go back into competition, contact sports for at least a year. And how well is that received? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most of them turn around to me and tell me to get knotted or fuck off, I think is the word I hear the most. It isn't well tolerated. But 
on my reading in and around recurrence rates of injuries, I am very much beginning to realise that rushing some injuries back into play too soon, too quick, too early could be doing them a detriment and putting them at higher risk of recurrence. We see it with ACLs. We see it with hamstring strains. It's finding that that common sense boundary, I think, of between getting somebody back, doing the things they want to do, but not pushing them too fast, too fast, that puts them at greater risk of recurrence. And then they get more problems later on down the line. So for me, I think, you know, you can train, you can rehab, you can still do sports, you know, but when it comes to putting that shoulder that's had a dislocation under trauma back into the thing that actually made it dislocate, which, you know, a lot of the time I'm dealing with rugby players, rugby, martial arts, something along those lines, do not put it into an uncontrolled, unpredictable environment for at least a year. And I mean, you use the phrase or the term common sense, it does make sense. Just if you stand back from a bird's eye, uh, sorry, a helicopter view and look at the problem that, you know, just just give it time, which is so difficult for all of us. Uh, in terms yeah. of pres- prescriptive exercises, Adam, I mean, obviously there's always, it's dependent on who's in front of you and their sport and their goals, uh, their condition, et cetera. But, uh, you know, are there any sort of go-to exercises you like in those early days incorporating grip? gripping things hard or- yeah so again i do like cheesy one-liners and here's one for you when it comes to the loose shoulder think of closed chain for the game think of closed chain for the gain and those that aren't aware of closed chain so this is basically putting the hand into contact with a surface to close the loop so it's it's using either walls, floors, tabletops, etc., to to apply a little bit of a say a closed chain action around the upper limb. So a lot of the upper limb work we do, you know, the hand is free in space, it's open chain. Um, there's nothing to say you can't use open chain exercises with loose shoulders. Of course you can, but I do very much like to start them off with closed chain exercises. Reason being, I think they have some unique benefits for a shoulder. One, the compression forces that are experienced through the closed chain action can increase the proprioceptive input into the girdle. So, you know, you get that sort of co-contraction, proprioception uh, input as well. I do find in the early stages it helps reassure the patients. They feel a lot more secure in control with regards to closed chain exercises than they do open chain exercises. So it allows them to buy in a bit sooner as well. Uh, and they can be quite challenging, you know, so you can still get the same sort of strength gains and benefits as you would do with an open chain exercise just with those other benefits. And, you know, just very being very practical, painted an example of one or two of these closed chain exercises, Adam. So a simple version, you know, is you can start getting people just to do sort of um, drills up against the wall. So place their hand, you know, palm up against the wall in front of them roughly mid zone so around 90 degrees i get my shoulders doing this within you know 24 hours of relocation and just a bit of body weight by either leaning into the uh, wall um, and just sort of isometrically contracting and holding the forces around the shoulder there asking them to move the lower limbs around a bit so they get a little bit of trunk rotation around the arm as they've got it pinned up against the wall. Even something as simple as just a wall push-up. You know, a simple wall push-up, closed chain exercise, just gets that system going and starts to get the humeral head moving on the glenoid a little bit. But in a safe-ish mid-zone, it's not putting it end of ranges. It's going to start to get the muscles to work and activate and so as prevent deconditioning and, again, flood that system with proprioceptive information. And then the other things you can do, nice and simple, is just get them down on the ground and go through your Pilates, Schmilates type exercises. You know, get them doing all their uh, four point kneeling, three point kneeling, get them doing their bird dogs. You know, just make sure their transverse abdominuses are contracted and the pelvis is in neutral because that shit is really important. You know that, don't you? Oh, that, <laughs> that's me being sarcastic, by the way, people. I hope that's coming across. That's me being sarcastic. Uh, well, Common sense, let common sense prevail. <laughs> but Pilates exercises... I never got it either. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. But Pilates exercises are good. You know, I just think we've got to just change the narrative around why they're good. You know, it isn't about bracing and holding things in. It's just that it's novel stimulus in a different situation in a closed chain. So I, I use a lot of Pilates-based exercises, yoga-based exercises. I'm just not going through all the bullshit explanations that a lot of physios or therapists use around it. It is just getting people down on the ground flooding that system with a bit of information proprioceptively from compression forces and it is just working the system hard think of closed chain for the gain so first time dislocators thanks for taking us there adam the recurrent dislocator i.e more than one episode 
Uh, it seems to be that it doesn't matter if they're two years apart or five years apart or six months apart, they're still a recurrent dislocator, or is that not correct? Well, the, the, again, Margie Zolds has found that actually the risk of re-dislocating, if you can get through two years without re-dislocating, you're probably going to be all right, probably. Can't say for definitely, but there's low, there's lower chance of reoccurrence if you go through the first two years without a second episode. Um, so, yeah, recurrency uh, uh, dislocators, they're, they're a bit harder to treat. Um, and again, there is a certain group who are more likely to be recurrent dislocators. The first group is the simple uh, younger age range. So if you're younger and you're a dislocator, there's a higher risk of re-dislocation, up to 90% in the under 25s. Um, also, those with bony bank heart lesions, that is another risk factor for higher risk of recurrence. And also individuals who experience higher levels of pain and disability after their dislocation. And the last thing to keep an eye out for is individuals who report high fear of re-injury. So if they've got the psychosocial factor or the psychological factors around that injury, then they are also at higher risk of re-dislocation. So I think, you know, if you've got somebody mid-20s, first-time dislocation, with a large bony bank heart, high levels of pain and disability, high levels of fear of re-injury, that individual is going to be challenging to rehab. And the chances are they will probably re-dislocate at some point, possibly. But Again, in that individual, we also know there's a low chance of them going back to the tasks or the sports that actually made their shoulder uh, pop out. So fear of re-injury can also inhibit people from returning back to, to tasks and activities that made shoulders dislocate. But if they can get through two years, they may be okay. Otherwise, keep an eye out for you're out for what you just shared there, Adam. And then, you know, practically, what might an orthopedic surgeon do? What are some of the... the uh, contemporary techniques yep so for the bony defects now the most common sort of procedure is the latage so this is a bony transfer operation to try and restore the uh, glenoid defect from a bony bank art uh, so they'll use your coracoid process so the orthopods now will osteotomize the coracoid and they'll transfer that down and around to where the uh, fragment of the fracture was on the glenoid anchor your coracoid process in there and that helps restore the bony congruency for the joint. However, again, there's been some questions around how the bank heart, uh, sorry, the latage works uh, because we also see that actually when you transfer the coracoid process down, it doesn't actually unite with the glenoid in a lot of people. So the blood supply doesn't reestablish and so that bony coracoid process is slowly broken down and reabsorbed over a period of time. So when you go back and look at somebody who's had a latage and you say put them in a CT scanner, uh, a lot of the time you will not see that coracoid process there where it should be. It's been broken down by the body. Instead, you've got a soft tissue fibrotic mass around that area, but they still feel stable. The theory is it could also be that the conjoint tendon is also transferred down and around with the coracoid process. So the conjoint tendon is the, the combined tendon of the pecs, the short head uh, uh, biceps, the pecs minor, and the coracobrachialis that all attaches onto the coracoid tip, and they transfer that down and around with this operation. And the theory is, is that this tendon now starts to act like an inferior glenohumeral ligament. So you've now got a reinforcement around the anterior inferior portion of the shoulder. So when people bring their arms up into abduction and external rotation, this tendon acts like a glenohumeral ligament, and that's what gives them the stability. So the latage works, but it may not be working through restoring bony congruence. It may be more soft tissue stabilization. Okay, so the mechanism's you know debatable, I guess, but the main thing is it it, it does it is effective. It and yep. uh, other techniques, Adam. Well, that's the that's the predominant one, the latage. Yeah, so that helps with the bony uh, bank art. Obviously, the the labral bank art. You can just do an arth an orth arthroscopic uh, labral repair, so a keyhole surgery, where the surgeon will just use a couple of sutures to hold the labrum back down onto the glenoid to help restore uh, passive structural stability there. There's also capsule operations as well. So if the labrum the in uh, ligaments and the capsule have been damaged, then there's the capsular shift operation, uh, classically where they use the inferior portion of the capsule to pull that up and over, uh, the anterior portion of the superior capsule to sort of stabilize it. The best way I try to describe that to some people, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the best way to, do, uh, to describe that is a bit like pulling your pants up over your vest. It just stops your belly from hanging out the front. 
So that's the inferior capsule shift. Uh, so those are the sort of main operations used around uh, the shoulders. The other one is for a heel sax defect. So if you've got a large heel sax defect that's ongoing and causing problems, our orthopedic surgeons do a couple of options there. So there's either the remplissage, which is an infilling of the defect by screwing in the soft tissues in and around it to fill out the void or bone grafting. So we'll use some iliac bone crest and sort of fill in the void on the humeral head with some bone grafting to help restore the congruency there. So a few techniques and then Adam, the discharge from the care of the orthopedic surgeon is post-surgery care then best followed in tandem with the first time dislocator, i.e. minimize immobilization. Depends, I guess, on the technique, uh, the surgical technique, yep. any uh, suit, you know, uh, just depends, I guess. Yeah, surgeon to surgeon will have different protocols post-operatively depending on whether how long they want it protected for protected ranges of movement. Most of the surgeons that I work with will still allow movement, um, but it's just within a protected zone. So you're just not stressing the things that they've repaired too soon, too quick. So classically, obviously, you know, abduction, external rotation positions for anything that's been repaired around the anterior inferior quadrant are going to be avoided for six to eight weeks, depending on how tissue healing is going. And uh, for the posterior stabilizations, it's not bringing the arm across the body into horizontal abduction uh, again for four to six weeks, just to allow those posterior structures not to get too much um, tension or pulling around. If you missed last week's episode, an expert edition featuring Associate Professor Dr. Patrick Weinrack on all things hip joint disorders and management, then here's a little snippet of what you missed. If you're performing well and you're functionally good, if you've got a little cartilage tear in your hip or you've got something going, it doesn't necessarily have to be your hip, but if you've got some sort of musculoskeletal ailment but it's not interfering, sometimes the better thing is to just watch and observe. Get advice, but you don't necessarily have to be railroaded down the road of having treatment or surgery. To tune into the full episode featuring Dr. Patrick Weinrack, be sure to jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from. And whilst there, peruse the archives, including Coaches Corners, Expert Editions, Featured Performers, and Interest Editions, all with the one theme and aim to help you, the listener, perform at your physical best. For now, let's jump back on this Expert Edition with the sports physio, Adam Meekins, on all things the unstable shoulder. Adam, uh, Hamish the physio did ask, I think, a great question. What's the role of taping in shoulder, in the loose shoulder? We see it. We see it on the football pitch. Um, we, you know, we see it all the time. What are your opinions on taping the loose shoulder? As long as it's the hot pink tape, then it's all okay. Hot pink tape or not at all? I, if it isn't the hot pink, then I'm not interested in it. No. <laughs> so uh, uh, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I, again, taping is something that I've gone through a love-hate relationship for. When I worked in sports, I very much, you know, was taught about kinesio taping and I started to use it. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is novel. This is good. Got a bit carried away in thinking about what I could use it for and how to use it. Players loved it as well. You know, they like being wrapped up in it. I think tape works for, again, for a very simplistic mechanism. It, it just gives people, I think, a sensation of security. So particularly around the shoulder that may feel a bit loose, I think, you know, putting some tape on that pulls on the skin uh, can just give a, a, an illusion or a sensation of instability, which could be beneficial, but could also be detrimental because it could allow people to falsely think they're better or more stable than they actually are. Uh, but it could also allow people to carry on doing tasks that they were avoidant or fearful of doing as well. So I think, you know, there's 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 positives and negatives. I think in a sporting environment, my my thinking now for tape is use as little as necessary, if at all. Uh, the biggest downside with tape is you're highlighting to your opposition where your weak spot is. Mm. You're painting a target on yourself. So I always try to tell my guys and my girls that I'm working with, if you're working in a competition sport, particularly a contact sport, do not advertise your weaknesses to your opposition and taping just paints a fucking bullseye on you. Yeah. And, you know, when I used to play rugby, I, you know, I was a dirty player. Everybody is tactics. You know, you, you try to find, how am I going to get this person out of my way so I can do what I need to do? Oh, uh, look, there's a bit of tape on there. That, I bet that hurts him when I give that a kick or a poke <laughs> or a 
What am I going to do? I'm going to go and give it a kick and a poke and a press. Fair, yeah. mate. Yeah, once again, there's that uh, common sense. Uh, pink tape uh, is an advertisement for the weakness. Uh, fourth point, Adam, uh, in terms of beliefs, we know that beliefs matter. What are some of the mistaken beliefs you see in the, in the, the, in the person with a loose shoulder? Uh, well, from the individual or from the therapist, do you think, mate? Both. Uh, well, I think some of the mistakes I see or uh, problems I see, I think, with therapists when it comes to, you know, managing of the unstable shoulders, they have to wrap it up in cotton wool. You know, I, I do see a lot of fear of about, you know, exposing a shoulder back into some robust rehab. Um, again, a lot of therapists tend to believe that they only can work on the rotator cuff and therefore they give these sort of rotator cuff related exercises to try and help the shoulder, which you do have to do, but they're not the only things you need to be doing. So I think I see a lot of sort of just focusing on the control, motor control type exercises around a loose shoulder rather than the sort of more compound, larger movements, uh, getting the shoulder girdle moving as a, as a functional unit, incorporating the kinetic chain as well getting them back doing things that sometimes are you know a bit faster on movement a bit more plyometric a bit more ballistic and basically exposing a shoulder uh, into some unexpected and random events just gradually slowly progressively just using your common sense but I find a lot of physiotherapists you know they'll do the basics and they'll say good right I'm done here you're good to go back to play and I'm like well 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 you have not exposed that shoulder through a process of graded exposure back into some some unexpected random movements that it's going to have to experience if it wants to play sport and hold its integrity. So I think that is is a, is a mistake I see is just the physio is not really challenging or progressing a, a loose shoulder robustly enough. I think, you know, when it comes to those unexpected random movements, uh, a thing that I really like around a, a loose shoulder towards the end for the rehabilitation is the perturbations. You know, there's a perturbation is just, you know, an external stimulus acting on somebody that they have to react to. And you can just grade their exposure to how robust you make that perturbation. You can start off very low grade in the early stages. Again, four point kneeling in that position. You just start to tap that arm around. You know, you just start to get that person braced against the reaction. You get them sort of anticipating it so there's not too much high fear straight away you just start to poke that arm around you move their trunk around you just get them to react against it you say just stabilize brace yourself against this force that's coming you ready you ready boom then knock them over and then you just gradually start to expose them to more randomness higher forces higher intensities you start to make it a little bit more unpredictable take away some of the visual and verbal cues you reduce bases of support etc etc you just get them to start to get that system used to unexpected stimulus and its speed and its reaction that it can react to that. Yeah, a powerful principle and certainly that underdoing of rehabilitation not being pushed hard enough. I, you know, in my 14 years in the industry, I, I certainly now see as one of the, you know, the often times failings of uh, of rehabilitation attempts. Yeah, physios are very good at calming shit down, but not so good at building shit back up. So I think, you know, that, that that's, you know, part of our job is to, to calm shit down when it hurts and when it feels sore, when it's had a dislocation. But uh, the other part of our job is building it back up so it's robust and it's strong and it's resilient to go back and do the things that it can't do again. And I find physios very much get taught and learn and they focus on calming shit down with the manual therapy, electrotherapy, low loaded exercises, excellent. you know, it's all good. It's all great. But what they don't do very well is there's the final stage is building shit back up again. And that's something, again, that we I think we are slowly beginning to change. And I think the more of us start moaning and keeping banging on about it, the better it will be. And certainly, uh, you know, you've been a big catalyst within the, in the industry for bringing a, a greater awareness to the needs to, to push people in rehab and make them more robust, resilient, all the buzzwords. Uh, I like... Uh, Jared Powell's and it may be you know uh, maybe other people's work but he just sort of breaks it down it might be yours Adam that's you know the pushing the pulling the raising the lifting the carrying and thinking about the kinetic chain like you know just basic movements and geez dumbbells are sexy right uh, just pick them up and move them around no, kettlebells are sexier than dumbbells You've got to speak to Neil about that haven't you <laughs> yeah. so Adam look this is uh, this has been great and uh, you know thank you for bringing a bit of light heartedness to an otherwise fairly uh, you know uh, in, you know, could be a dry topic. It's been terrific, Adam. Uh, your maxims. It's uh, this is some of my favourites. Adam, Adam Meekins's. Uh, it's tough being a cuff. Uh, you can't go wrong getting strong. 
Uh, and maybe, no, you know, you rolled your eyes and maybe uh, it's tough being a cuff, isn't yours? No, that's one of my colleagues. That's how it sometimes gets misaccredited to me, but that's one of my colleagues called Andrew Jaggy, uh, who's a, a physiotherapist who works just up the road from where I am. So I, I, I've used it before, but no, it's, it's definitely not one of mine. It's Andrew Jaggy's. But yeah, can't go wrong getting strong is definitely one of mine. That's the one I tend to use the most, as well as strength and to lengthen. I like that one as well. Strengthen to lengthen, and they're just so commonsensical. And, uh, you know, I don't know where it's from, but we don't treat painful shoulders. We treat people in pain. Let's not forget that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it, I, again, as I say to a lot of physios, if you're not prepared to treat the person, you're not prepared to treat anything. So you, you can't just get tunnel vision with ACL reconstructions. You can't get tunnel vision with shoulder dislocations. You can't get tunnel vision with chronic low back pain. You have to recognize the, the psychosocial factors the human factors attached to this person with back pain, with a shoulder dislocation, with an ACL reconstruction. Uh, so you just got to recognize that. Some things you can address as a physiotherapist, some things you can't. You just need to know where to signpost people if you need help as well. Just need to recognize you've got to treat the people holistically. Yeah. Adam, if you could boil everything you've learned down to one piece of advice, and let's go broader than the loose or wobbly shoulder, to help people perform at their best, what would Adam Meekins' one piece of advice be? I, I, again, I think I'll just stick with you can't go wrong getting strong. I think, you know, for me, that is a simple analogy, metaphor, whatever you want to call it, that just covers all things in life. You know, I think it's not only physical strength, but, you know, emotional strength, emotional resilience and robustness, you know, develop some strength in all aspects of your life and you can't go wrong. Yeah. What a powerful principle. Hard to argue with that. Adam, every guest of the Physical Performance Show, be it an expert edition or otherwise, issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week so what is adam meekins's physical challenge going to be well i have been currently doing 100 squats a day for the whole month of august so i think i'm going to get everybody to join in with me and try and do 100 body weight squats in any different foot position you know you want i don't really mind but just get your ass down lift it back up again with your body weight, try and do 100 reps in a 24-hour period and uh, come and join me for 100 squats a day in August. It's now tw day 22 and I am, uh, I'm doing all right. I'm beginning to feed. I, I thought, you know, I like squatting anyway at the best of time, but I thought 100 extra body weight squats and stuff, we'll see how it goes and it's been good. I've enjoyed it. And we should point out that this is not squats with a, a Q, this is squats with a K. Yeah, all squats are spelt with a K, W. And a Z at the end as well, squats. Perfect. And uh, is there any criteria for a valid squat? Are we talking about 90 degrees or what's the... What's the uh, I don't, I'd say, again, people overcomplicate mm. that. You know, I don't care. As long as you're getting your bum down and you lift it back up again, you know, I don't mind. Obviously, the lower, the better. You know, you work it through a greater range of movement, but, you know, you have to work with what you can do. Everybody's got different anthropometrics. Everybody's got different structural uh, things around their, their lower limbs, which allow them to squat differently from other people. So just just do what you can. Yeah, perfect. Adam, uh, just, just practically, quickly looping back, you've mentioned the psychological factors a couple of times there uh, for – for anyone really, but say in this context, people with shoulder pain, clinically, are there any screening tools you may use there or are you just listening out for some of these, you know, these expressions of fear and apprehension and avoidance? There are psychometric questionnaires that you could use for evaluating somebody's fear of re-injury, but I've played around with a few of them. They're okay. Uh, for me, it is, it's like you just said, it's, it's listening to the person, what they're telling you. It's, it's gauging their reaction when you put them into certain environments and under certain situations. And for me, the biggest way to tell if somebody's got any fear of re-injury is to ask them, Yeah. do you trust this shoulder to go back and do the things that it has been not doing before? And if there's any sort of doubt, fear, you know, hesitation, I'm like, no, you're not ready, are you? Keep it simple, scientist. Absolutely. Brilliant. Adam, uh, you are everywhere. Where can we find out more? Follow the journey. Join the Squats Challenge. Uh, even if this goes live outside of August, where are we best to uh, keep up to pace with uh, Adam Meekins? Uh, I'm across all sorts of social media platforms now. I've even joined the Instagram, so I've been on there for the last year or so. I, I sort of tried to keep away from Instagram for a little while because I just thought it was a hive of nonsense. I still do. There's this <laughs> stack loads of crap that's on Instagram compared to other social media um, platforms, but I'm on there now, so you can come and find me uh, at Adam Meekins, all one word, uh, but I also undergo my pseudonym as well, The Sports Physio, so I use 
use that and you can find me on there. I'm on social media platforms, Twitter and Facebook as well. Again, under Adam Meekins or the uh, sports video. And touring the world uh, year on year for your shoulder course amongst others. Yeah, I am still amazed that, that that has taken off as good as it has done. It's something that I never thought in a million years I would be doing, which was going around and becoming one of these gurus teaching courses all over the place. I am forever amazed and thankful as well that I get the opportunity to do that. So thanks to anybody who has been on my course or is due to come on my course. It is very much appreciated. It's humbling and flattering for people to want to come and listen to me for two days ranting and raving around all things physiotherapy, using the shoulder as a template, really. Uh, brilliant. And I'll be uh, signing up for, for one of your courses, hopefully uh, in the coming year. Adam, uh, thank you for your contribution, sharing your knowledge. Uh, really appreciate it. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me on. Thoroughly enjoyed it. So there you have it, another episode of The Physical Performance Show, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, and you know someone in your world who would benefit from the sharings and the knowledge of Adam Meekins, please consider sharing the episode, the link with them. Also, if you took something from today's sharings, please let Adam know. He is easily found over on Instagram or Twitter at Adam Meekins. M-E-A-K-I-N-S, Adam Meekins. You'll find all of Adam's handles over on the show notes at pogophysio.com.au. And Adam is a fantastic follow on social media. He is not afraid to share his opinions. And as stated at the top of the show, myself as a sports physiotherapist has been a beneficiary of all the work and content that Adam Meekins puts out. Massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews for the show. Aside from being a whole lot of fun to read and most times encouraging, it also is a great way for the show to grow. Of course, don't forget to hit subscribe if you are enjoying the Physical Performance Show from wherever it is that you're enjoying it from. A massive thanks this week to show listener Nick, who commented over on iTunes, love having this podcast and the fantastic guests keep me company and inspired on my Sunday long runs. The podcast is really engaging, easy to listen to, accessible and super informative. A really amazing and inspiring resource. Keep up the great work. Nick, thank you for the rating and review. It means a lot. And you, you listening in, you are the reason why this show goes live week to week. So thank you for your feedback and your support. Don't forget to keep the podsies coming as well. They are a whole lot of fun. That's simply a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show. You'll find myself over on social media also at Brad underscore beer and share the episode that you're enjoying at any given moment. Massive thanks to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Susan Wilkin, all things show administration. Matthew Walding, all things show graphic design. And Oliver Crossley, assisting behind the scenes. A reminder again, be sure to follow Adam Meekins over on social media for some great content to help you perform at your best. And if you're a practitioner, consider attending one of Adam's upcoming shoulder workshops aptly titled The Shoulder. Complex doesn't have to be complicated. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we shift gears from the expert editions and we jump over to bring you a conversation I had recently with Australian distance running star, and featured performer Ellie Pashley. Ellie is an Australian distance runner on the rise. She's a city to surf champion and boasts Australian all-time marathon and 10,000 meter performances that put her inside the top 20 and top 10 Australian all-time performances. Ellie was also the second place getter in the 2019 edition of the half marathon at the Gold Coast Marathon. Now, following Ellie Pashley's Featured Performer episode, we'll launch into a further series of expert editions on all things running injuries, including a doubleheader, bone stress, injury management, and rehabilitation deep dive with US-based physical therapists Chris Johnson and Nathan Carlson. So until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been The Physical Performance Show.